In 929 Japan, during the reign of Emperor Daigo, a traveling monk by the name of Anjin journeys from Mutsu on a pilgrimage to the Kumano Hongu, a sacred temple 100 kilometers south of Dojoji. While he makes this journey once per year and is always sure to stay at the manor of the Masako no Shoji family between Dojoji and Kumano, this year's visit is special. During his stay, his handsome youthfulness earns him the attention of the lord of the manor's daughter, Kiyohime. The young girl floods Anshin with attention, proving to be quite troublesome. Jokingly, Anshin suggests that if she behaves herself as a good girl, he will marry her and take her back to his home in Mutsu. Kiyohime takes this to heart, allowing her infatuation to blossom into a passionate love. That night, she visits Anshin's room, hoping to bed with him. Alarmed, Anshin bluntly rejects her. After seeing her distraught face, he becomes embarrassed that she took his earlier joke so seriously. In an attempt to rid himself of the situation, he tells Kiyohime that he will return for her after completing his pilgrimage. To this, Kiyohime is delighted and leaves his room, eagerly awaiting Anshin's return. The priest departs the village and reaches his destination at Kumano. Of course, Anshin knows his promise to Kiyohime is insincere. Having no intentions to marry or even so much as apologize to her, he actively avoids the manor to head directly toward Mutsu. Time passes and Kiyohime begins to worry about Anshin. She explores the village and hears from a group of trekkers that Anshin had already passed through. This knowledge fills Kiyohime with grief. Determined to marry the priest, she chases after him barefoot and catches up to him along the road to Dojoji. She calls out to Anshin, but the priest merely brushes her off, claiming she has mistaken him for someone else and should leave because he is already running late for a meeting. Kiyohime's tears turn to scorn, sending her into a vengeful assault. In defense, Anshin prays to Kumano Gongen, the local deity, to save him, conjuring a brilliant light that impresses Kiyohime while simultaneously paralyzing her. Anshin takes this chance to escape, fleeing to Dojoji. Before reaching his haven, he pays the boatman for a ride across the Hidaka River, begging him to refuse service to Kiyohime. Left to wallow in her own anger, Kiyohime's rage overflows. From the divine shimmer of Kumano Gongen's light, she transforms into a massive serpent with breath of fire. She pursues Anshin and bypasses the boatman altogether by swimming across the river in her serpent form. When Anshin arrives at Dojoji, he tells his fellow priests that he is being pursued by a young girl. The priests find this humorous at first until they see in the distance that Anshin's pursuer is actually a Japanese dragon. They assist Anshin by hiding him beneath a massive bronze temple bell. Kiyohime rushes the building, unable to find her target. As a serpent, however, she manages to smell Anshin hiding beneath the bell. Her anger at its highest point, Kiyohime wraps herself around the bell and torches it with her breath. In no time, the bell's bronze turns into a devastating white, cooking the priest inside. I loved him. I loved him. I loved him. He betrayed me. I was sad. 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 I hate him. I hate him. I hate him. Hate. 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 So I burned him to death. With her beloved Anshin dead, she is able to return to her senses. Realizing she has killed the target of her affections, she discards her own life by drowning in the river. Her actions are the basis for various pieces of Japanese folklore that are passed down for centuries and subsequently recorded into the throne of heroes, allowing her to be summoned as a berserker-class servant. In the modern era, Ritsuka Fujimaru the last available mage for the Caldea Security Organization fights to save humanity from incineration by restoring seven singularities. In the first, a distorted variant of the Hundred Years' War in Orleans, France, Ritsuka discovers Kiyohime has been summoned by the Grail and is occupying her time bickering with Elizabeth Bathory. When Ritsuka interrupts them, Kiyohime is instantly smitten 
interpreting the Chaldean Master as none other than a reincarnation of her beloved Anshin. Thus, she joins the party and uses her scalding fire attacks to vanquish her foes, while being a bit of a detriment to her own team for the flame's sheer intensity. She is highly devoted and means well, but is also quite dangerous. Ritsuka must be sure never to lie to her, else they incur Kiyohime's wrath and likely the loss of their command spells. Her madness enhancement allows her to see through lies and deception, serving as a double-edged sword. Beyond that, she furthers herself as a fine bride with a talent for cooking and helps Ritsuka fight against John Alter to solve the singularity. As a newfound resident of Caldea, Kiyohime assists Ritsuka once more during Halloween, ascending Elizabeth Bathory's festive castle. Of course, she also joins Ritsuka in the fight against Getia in Solomon's Grand Temple of Time. In battle, Kiyohime possesses the skill to shapeshift, such that when she can no longer run, she simply transforms into a poisonous snake dragon. This form is involved with her noble phantasm, Samadhi, through transforming flames, by which she can both torch and constrict foes. It's worth noting that, despite her dragon form, she has no dragon blood or attribute. Rather, this transformation is a representation of her wrath and sheer tenacity toward the man who lied to her in life. On a separate occasion, Kiyohime finds herself isolated with Ritsuka and Mashu in an unknown land, out of contact from Caldea. With nothing left to do but explore, she remarks that she's never taken a trip and that chasing after Anshin doesn't count. She is excited to venture in the sunlight with her master. Certainly, however, on the verge of potential romance, their romp is instantly interrupted by the arrival of monsters. Kiyohime blames this ill fortune on her harsh actions in life, but decides to fight for Ritsuka's sake. Resuming their travels, Kiyohime recalls her time chasing Anshin, only ever being able to look upon his dreamy back. While she regrets killing him, she wonders why he never once uttered an apology for lying and fleeing from her. Surely any kind of acknowledgement would have done. She details a chat she once had with Tamamo no Mae, who told her she misunderstands why Anshin left her. Tamamo tells Kiyohime that Anshin liked her at least a little bit, but her response was to love far more heavily than the love she was dealt. Kiyohime overindulges in her passion, making mountains of molehills. Tamamo adds that her approach is either to love immensely or hate tremendously, with nothing in between. Kiyohime takes this advice and admits she does not understand men's feelings. However, she is reluctant to wholly trust Tamamo's love experience, reasoning that Tamamo is the type to be easily swept away by a man's advances because she finds happiness in obediently serving her lovers. That considered, Kiyohime takes this chance to ask Ritsuka many things she is curious about, such as their birth, way of life, food preferences, preferences in men and women, daily routine, height, weight, eyesight, grip strength, speed, endurance, lung capacity, athletic experience, and most of all, which temples they are familiar with. Teasingly, she keeps the purpose of this knowledge secret. By this point in their journey, she notices a pleasant aroma, the stench of blood, thereby detecting the presence of Lamia. Once more, she protects her master. Their trek leads them to a cavern, and within, Kiyohime is confronted by a shadow of herself, urging her to discard her pretty face and embrace the beastly snake within. This shadow servant pressures her on the idea of being loved in spite of her horrific truth that pining for Ritsuka's affections is merely a form of deceit. The shadow urges Ritsuka to abandon Kiyohime, claiming that, just like Anshin, she will eventually murder them over a petty lie. Ritsuka, kind-hearted as always, refuses to abandon her, placing their trust in her. Once the shadow is no more, Kiyohime begs Ritsuka to truthfully answer if they find her hideous. Without hesitation, Ritsuka accepts Kiyohime, dragon and all. In exchange, Kiyohime vows to make the horrible things her shadow said turn into lies. Come time for summer, Kiyohime is summoned as a Lancer-class servant, 
Dressed in a refined swimsuit, equipped with a naginata, a bladed Japanese pole arm. She claims to be weak and frail in martial arts, but nonetheless holds her own with sheer, merciless killing intent. Her traditional Japanese nature renders her embarrassed to be wearing a swimsuit, but she endures it so that she can make Ritsuka happy. Suggestively, she insists she cannot be held responsible for any accidents that follow her being complimented. Inspired by her legend, Kiyohime's noble phantasm in this form is Dojoji Bell, Method 108, Fire Dragon Mower. It is a technique where she traps her opponents in a bell, engulfs it in flames, and pierces them through with an array of naginata. As a heroic spirit, Kiyohime is given a second chance at life, an opportunity to redeem herself for her actions, but also to utilize her failures as a means of helping her new love. In this pursuit, she is more than sincere and worthy of Ritsuka's trust. Thanks for watching! If you enjoy this channel, help me beat the algorithm by liking, commenting, and sharing the video, subscribing to Otaku Daikun, and most of all, smashing that notification bell as if it were your waifu. That way you'll never miss out on all of my anime content, lore videos, live streams, and holy waifu wars polls. My vids are struggling to get featured, so that bell is absolutely critical. If you want to support me directly, check out my Patreon, or consider donating via Super Chat. And as always, celebrate your fandom!